Welcome everyone to Jews in Sports presented by jifoundation.org and h.com. We have a really, really special episode here. Usually I have a whole format and we're going to throw that out of the way because the lessons, the wisdom, the journey that we are about to embark on with Dr. Alex Sternberg is going to be phenomenal. I'll just quickly give you, he does so many things. So I'll just quickly give you the info that I have, you know, number one in karate, huge deal in karate being, you know, uh, on, on jur- on magazines and such in his world of karate, he is very famous and well known. And then what he does, he's son of a Holocaust survivor, you know, the things he's done in Holocaust education and being able to impact others. And just, I, I there's so much that I'm just going to throw it to you in this conversation first, and you have uh, things to show us, and you, hopefully we will be impacted greatly by your story, and again, your incredible athletic background and career, and just who you are, and I- I'm so excited to, to give you the floor for, the, for your introduction when I usually introduce. <laughs> I, I appreciate very much, uh, and i like to thank you for inviting me on your program. It's always a delight for me to be able to speak on these uh, formats, on these, uh, to reach young people, especially a topic that is so dear to my heart and, and, and sums up my entire career, Orthodox Jews pursuing mm-hmm. sports. Yes. This has been what uh, I have been doing since I was a teenager. And uh, it's a very uphill battle. Orthodox Jews, you know what they always used to say that the encyclopedia of Jewish sports heroes is about uh, one page long. <laughs> because we don't have so many. You know, there is a, there is a question uh, that sometimes when I give speeches, I ask, do you know what is, how you define bar mitzvah? Mm-hmm. And uh, the typical answer is that bar mitzvah is the age where an average Jewish boy first realizes that his chances of owning a professional sports team are much better than ever playing on one. So to, inter- to interrupt you, my father has, my brother comes in, he goes, I want to be the quarterback of the New England Patriots. And my father's gut reaction was, you're not going to play on them. You're going to own the team. <laughs> <laughs> Just reaction. And by the way, to add to your, to your thing, yes, I had on, um, in our day and age, you know, the ortho, uh, summit of the, uh, you know, uh, Orthodox Jewish athletes, and there's five, seven of us, six of us, you know, there's not that many of us. So you're correct. It's an uphill battle. Well, the fact of the matter is, I just wrote an article that appeared, I think, either in the Jerusalem Post or the Times of Israel, about a young woman in Israel. Her name is B.D. Deutsch. Yes, she's been on here, and I know her, and yes. we're good friends. And when I first became aware of her story, I said, oh, my God, I have to uh, try to get in touch with her. And I also found another wo- a young woman here in my neighborhood, and I'm sorry that my mind... S.C. Ackerman, no ping pong? That's the one, ping pong. Yeah, she S. was on here as Ackerman. well. And I spoke with Esti at length. She's a wonderful young wonderful. woman. And, and I wrote an article about both of them. But I also included in the article a story from 1982. I coached the U.S. national karate team at that time. And in my, I had a number of karate schools in the New York area. My karate schools were always located in Flatbush, in, uh, in uh, Forest Hills, in Jewish communities, where there was a very large segment of Orthodox Jews. And I drew from this demographic lots of kids who were yeshiva kids, boys and girls. I had a young lady in my Queens karate school that was a graduate of Beis Yaakov Academy. She was a very strong, her father had a long beard. She became a national champion. And there was another woman from Boston. And the team trials for the world championships uh, was scheduled for Rosh Hashanah in 1982. So every time that I used to go to the world championships first as a competitor, and then I started to go as a coach. And um, I went in 1980 as a coach of the US national team. And then I would go later on as a referee because I became a referee for the world championship. So every year when I found out two years from now, what's the date for the world championship, which was always every two years around October, November, I checked my date. Oh my God, I hope it's not Rosh Hashanah. I hope it's not Yom Kippur. I hope it's not Sukkot. So this time it was Rosh Hashanah. 
I got in touch with the Karate Federation. Listen, guys, it's Rosh Hashanah. This was in August. So we had a couple of months. They refused to change the date. Mm. I was very disappointed. And I thought there was a twinge of anti-Semitism in the leadership at the time. Uh, I got some comments that were very, very unwelcome. Anyway, instead of taking it lying down, we got in touch with this guy. He was a lawyer. I don't know how good he was. His name was Alan Dershowitz. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just some, some guy on the side. Some I guy. He happened to be from Brooklyn. He grew up in Borough Park, where I did. I spoke we with were, Alan once. I spoke with him. Yeah. And Alan handled the case. And he, I saw him recently in Israel, in Herzliya. And when I mentioned to him, I don't think he remembers me anymore. I haven't seen him in years. I said to him, I am, oh, yes, the karate girls. He knew immediately what I was talking about. Anyway, we uh, sued. And uh, we were successful to a large extent, other than it evoked a lot of anti-Semitism on the part of team members and other members of the National Karate Federation. Mm. I had a lot of problems for years in, I was coach of the team. I got pushed off as coach. I came, I, I had a lot of issues, but that's the way it is. I, you know, like there's, there's no way to look back and say, gee whiz, I wish I would not have done it. There's no, that's not an issue. You know, so sure. let me start by telling you the following. I came to America in 1961. I came from Hungary. I am a child of Holocaust survivors. Both my mother and father survived Auschwitz, Bergen Bells and many other things. Uh, in fact, I wrote a book called Recipes from Auschwitz. My mother used to listen and speak with the other ladies about how they cooked different Hungarian dishes while oh they were goodness. working for the Nazis. And this is the way they passed the time. After the war, my mother wrote down the recipes that she learned from the other ladies, and she ultimately gave them to me, etc. And I include actual recipes, but I tell her story during this, in the book, with the, with the, the link of recipes from Auschwitz. Anyway. Wow, that's a beautiful way to honor your mom, to say a different Absolutely. way, a take on the Holocaust. You know, um, just because we were talking about um, BD Deutsch, and we were talking about the anti Semitism of karate and things like that, and you know, your experience with Holocaust and such. I mean, how should people, because this is what I do, and I'm curious to hear in the message from people, how should people react or feel when they, when they are faced with anti Semitic acts, anti Semitic feel? What is your take on how people should react or deal with anti Semitism? Okay. You know, that's a very profound question, and it's not something that I have never thought about to, uh, the answer. Number one, as a karate person, I'm an eighth degree black belt in Shotokan karate. And let's tell people it takes a long time to get there. It takes a lot of skill. It's very prestigious. I started training when I was 13 years old, and uh, I'm a lot older now, and I have spent all my life practicing karate, training in karate, right. Self-defense, so karate's defense, how we defend ourselves. Right. So more on to that point, as a karate expert, how do we respond to anti-Semitism and how do we hold ourselves in self-defense? So, as a karate person who is trained to fight and mm -hmm. react physically to a lot of things, and as a former activist who helped to build the Jewish Defense League with Rabbi Meir Kahana, which I did for four years, when I started with the organization, Rabbi Kahane got in touch with me because I was teaching karate in the Orthodox community of Brooklyn. And we built up the organization. Of course, Rabbi Kahane was Rabbi Kahane. I was a young kid. But I think that I helped to build the organization all over the country. And we ended up with thousands of members. So as an activist who has a background of right-wing activism with the JDL and a karate person, my initial response, if somebody calls me an effing Jew, is to break his nose. That's my initial response. But as I got older, I learned that that's not always the best uh, remedy. And one thing is for sure, and I, I will have to quote my mother and tell you where I'm coming from as a child of a Holocaust survivor. Very quickly, I grew up in Hungary. There was a boy who lived in my house. Who lived, there was a, we lived in a garden apartment with several houses off a circular uh, courtyard in the building. There was a boy, he was, he was not Jewish. 
and we were the same age and we were in the same crib and we grew up together and we played five years old, six years old, eight year old, nine year old, we played together and we played in Hungary. What did you play? You played soccer. Right. So one day and I kicked in a goal and he said, no goal. And I said, goal. And he said, no goal, you dirty Jew. And I was like, I'm not sure six, seven years old. I was a young child. Wow. I went home and I told my mother what he said. And I was confused by what he said. Right. My mother said to me, never let anybody call you a dirty Jew. I said, what should I do? My mother said, slap him across the face. And my mother was a very gentle college educated soul. And it, she was not a combative person. She was a very gentle person. Next time he called me a dirty Jew, I smacked him across the face. His mother went crazy and called me to my mother and so on and so forth. In any case, I learned from my mother, you stand up for yourself. Over the years, I learned that when people call you a dirty Jew, they're trying to belittle you. They're trying to bully you. They're trying to demean your person. They're trying to make you feel like you're less than what you are. And never ever forget, we Jews were writing and reading and giving the Torah to the world when their ancestors were swinging from trees in England or in Germany or in France, where they were uh, on a par with the baboons. We are the people of the book. We have a lot to be proud of. I'm a dirty Jew. No, you may say that only because you're jealous. Mm. Can I tell you what? There was a Jew in Israel in the early 40s. His name was Dov Gruner. He was a Hungarian Jew, emigrated to Israel in the late 30s and became a member of the Irgun, the Etzel, the underground movement. Wow. In one of the operations, he was shot, wounded, captured. Uh, the British put him on trial and ultimately accused him of a capital crime that he lifted arms up against the British Empire and they wanted to sentence him to death. During the trial, the judge said to him, you are a barbarian. Your people are barbarian. Dov Gruner stood up in the court and he looked at the judge and he said to the judge, when your ancestors were swinging from trees in England, mine were giving the Torah to the mankind and to the people of the world. Who are you calling a barbarian? Right. So Jewish pride is important. Somebody calls you a dirty Jew, you know what? It's important to explain. Now, if the guy is an avowed anti-Semite, am I going to change his mind? But I got to stand no. up for myself and not let it go. What so. you're saying is golden. And what you're saying, I'm so happy to have you on to say it the way you said it and the feel of how you said it. Is, and I've been trying as well to switch this connotation because as a psychologist, knowing, yes, right? They are trying, and these tropes all have similar things, trying to make you feel different so that way you react to slapping the person. Now, what the right answer is, I'm curious, you know, you, you're thinking about it. You know, I don't know if there is a right answer in different situations. I was talking with Rudy Rachman, who is a known activist as well in the Israel-Palestinian movement, uh, activism. And no, each situation is different. Okay. Can you reach a person and humanistically just say, hey, we're both humans and let's have a conversation and work this out. Sure, uh, I had a debate for Israel says you're not debating the person, you're debating people looking. So if there are people who are looking in and listening, don't focus on the person who's an anti-Semite, focus on those people and make an argument for those people. But it's a beautiful thing to say, if we react from the negative light and we, and we just come in right away to slap the person, you're, you're letting the person make you feel different instead of saying, yes, we need to stand up for ourselves. We do. And, and I'm just so happy to hear it the way you said it, the connotation from your mom saying, because your mom was saying that to you. Don't let him, gentle, kind soul, right. don't That's let right. him make you feel different. Slap him. That's how she you know, felt that you should stand up for yourself. There are other ways, but yes, you have to be proud of who you are. I have uh, been called a dirty Jew. Uh, not only at that time in Hungary, but I lived in Vienna for several months, for uh, less than a year. And uh, when I went to school every day, literally every day for months and months, 
my classmates went out to uh, the sidewalk when we were going home and they, uh, they stopped almost like in a chorus of a couple of lines and they were calling me Shmutzegeyu, they're Shmutzegeyu, they're dirty Jew because they found out I was Jewish. So every day, I was 10 years old when that happened and I smacked them. As much as possible, I smacked them. Now, yeah. uh, whenever I was faced with that, I didn't have a lot of um, interest in having an intellectual conversation. I'm very different and I think differently today. Maybe I'm more empowered, I have more information, I have been reading more, I have been writing more, you know, but there's a time when you got to slap the guy across the face, and there's a time when you can debate with him and you can explain to him. It depends on the situation, and every situation, as you said, is very, very different. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. Could, can you share with us, ending here, with, with karate, you know, story of a uh, uh, connection with Aish, as, as uh, how sport really can make an impact on, on Judaism and, and personality and changing people's life. And okay. Beautiful story. So in all the years that I've been training and teaching karate, uh, I was a Torah Vadas student. It's a very, very uh, well-known black hat yeshiva in Brooklyn. Uh, it's one of the top uh, uh, serious yeshivas of the world. Later on, when I started coaching karate and teaching karate, I had many, many students in the, uh, from the Orthodox neighborhoods, and I um, trained a lot of kids to defend themselves and so on. I think of one particular student who came to my Brooklyn karate school who was of Russian uh, background. He was about a year old when he came to uh, the United States from Russia. And he grew up in uh, Brooklyn and he was not religious. He didn't know anything. In fact, he didn't even have a bris mila, you know, which is not unusual from uh, Russia. They didn't have a lot of opportunities for bris. They didn't think about it. So when he came to America, he joined my karate school. He became very friendly with my son, Dove. And he used to come to my house a lot and he used to spend Shabbos there. And for a while and for a time period, he even uh, lived in my house in the 90. Three Maccabea, uh, maybe uh, sometime in the 90s, he made the U.S. team to the Maccabea Games. When they were in Israel, uh, my son and another one, Taro um, Ross, uh, took him to Eish Torah in Yerushalayim. He knew very little. He knew only whatever he absorbed in my house coming for Shabbos. So in, in Eish Torah in Yerushalayim, he got really turned on to Orthodox Judaism. So much so that when he came back from Israel, he immediately set about to arrange for his own circumcision, for his own bris. And with the help of a local rabbi in uh, the five towns in Long Island, Rabbi Wolowick, who's a Chabad rabbi, um, we arranged his, uh, his pidyon aben, his bris milah, and so on. Sometime after, he returned to Eish Torah in Israel and he learned in the yeshiva for years. I had occasion to visit him in the yeshiva. I walked in and I was like, wow, this is a real yeshiva. I didn't know much about Eish Torah. He was sitting at a bench and he was sitting and chuckling and he was by now wearing a black suit. His sisters was hanging out and so on. And later on, he graduated. I am not exactly sure. Uh, I think he got smicha. In any case, he works for an organization called RAGE, R-A-G-E. RAGE is an organization that is based in the Brooklyn area, and they are devoted and dedicated to bringing Russian young people back to Yiddishkeit. And this is what he wanted to do, and this is what he's doing. It's a tremendous story. You know, he married a young woman from, whose father was a big Chabad uh, Chassid, and they have, I'm not 100% sure, four or five children. He's a from from guy, and this was something that he was able to reach as a result of his experiences in sports and uh, being in Israel with the Maccabea Games. And with that beautiful story and a story which really encompasses the, you know, the ability to just make an impact and you don't know where through karate and through those, you know, Hashem sends us on these journeys that don't really make sense. And if you embrace it, I mean, your story is literally filled with so much inspiration and, and, and uniqueness in how you do it and, and the message with anti-Semitism and, and your mom and just everything is such a beautiful inspiration. Obviously, we'll have you back because you have so much info on, on Holocaust education and, and, and your, more on your karate story and just 
just, you've done so much in your life and your inspiration. So thank you so much for being here. Please, everyone, I'm going to go buy the book. Really, not that this was a plug for the book, but <laughs> hearing that all, it was more just to inspire. But really, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm sure it's wonderful and you're just an inspiration, really. I have to say that I am plugging the book. I didn't write it because I was expecting to make a lot of money. I wrote it because I wanted the Hungarian Jewish right. story to be told, my parents' story. And the Hungarian Jewish story is not that well known. Polish Jews are more, you know, covered, there's more information. So I am um, very, very much uh, doing a lot of my present day activism in trying to tell the story of the Hungarian Jews, the resistance that the Hungarian Jews did and what happened and so on. So I'm hoping that many, many people pick up a copy of the book and they read about the experience that the Hungarian Jews had. Right. And a couple of good recipes. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for inviting me on the show and it'll be my pleasure to return if you invite me again of course. And no we're gonna do something because again your perspective on anti-semitism on life on inspiring on on is very unique so we'll hopefully get to inspire more people uh yeah thanks everyone have an inspiring day and smile and make a difference <laughs>